afternoon to join us. And we are from Higher Education Licensure Pros. Uh, in case we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Chris Mall. Um, Nan and I co-founded Higher Education Licensure Pros just over three years ago, really in response to the July 1, 2020 regulations uh, that have been in effect related to professional licensure disclosures. So we were hearing from former colleagues at different institutions that they were really struggling uh, to understand the requirements and most importantly, struggling to do the research that it takes to know what uh, licensure requirements are across different states and territories. So that's a little bit about how we got started. Uh, we've been working with colleges and universities across the country, including some in Michigan uh, over these past few years, which we really enjoy being able to do. So uh, I did work in this field for quite a while, over 15 years now. Most of that time I spent working for Capella University, which is a large online for-profit institution headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that's where I got the opportunity to work with Nan. Uh, so I'll let her introduce herself to you all. Thanks, Chris. And hi, everyone. Um, yes, I first met Chris at Capella University. I worked there from 2010 to 2020. I started out working across schools, helping them gain specialized accreditation, and then in the School of Counseling, uh, providing operational support to many of their different areas and helping them to continue quality assurance standards. So becoming familiar with faculty advising, admissions, curriculum development, and data analysis. Prior to Capella, I worked at the University of Minnesota, uh, primarily in the School of Social Work. So that's a bit about me. Uh, back to you, Chris. Great. Thanks, Nan. So uh, what's our agenda for today? Um, again, thanks for making time this afternoon to join us here. I'm going to first start out with an overview of uh, the current, but mostly with the lens towards the upcoming July 1st federal Title IV regulations, uh, and then some related state authorization reciprocity agreement policy. So just again, an overview of that will probably be 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the most. If you'd like to ask questions while I'm going through that overview, please do. You can put questions in the chat or you can go ahead and, and ask them live on camera or audio. Definitely welcome those. After I do that overview, we're going to jump into a discussion. So put on your uh, thinking and discussing hats, if you will, please. Uh, I have some questions for us as a group to consider and to talk through. Um, you know, how it's going as far as implementing some of these specific requirements coming up for July 1. And then we probably will have some extra time for questions at the end as well. Uh, but definitely want to to provide answers and information and direct you to other resources today so that you feel like you walk away with a better grasp on what you need to do at your institution uh, to be ready for these July 1 changes. All right, so I'm gonna dive right in here to what is required. What are these regulations and policies uh, related to professional occupational licensure? So when we talk about this, we really like to break it down into three main responsibilities that all institutions have starting this July 1st um, under Title IV regulations. And then there are some things related to SARA policy. I'll mention those uh, a little bit here throughout as relevant. But the three main responsibilities are first, institutions need to understand how their programs related to a professional or occupational license meet the educational requirements in other US states and territories. So understanding how you meet the requirements in Michigan should be pretty straightforward and easy for all of you. It's all of the other states and territories where it can be uh, more work and more of a mystery to figure out what those educational requirements are and understand if your programs meet them or not. After an institution has an understanding, the second main responsibility, and this is the new one that's coming online for July 1st of this year, institutions have to certify that your programs meet the educational requirements for licensure, where your institution is located and wherever your students are located. I'll go into a little more detail on that in a slide or two here, but that's the main responsibility, certifying that your programs do indeed meet educational requirements where your institution is and where your students are located. That third responsibility is related to communicating the information. So uh, there are 
both public and direct disclosures that have been required since July 1 of 2020, the Department of Education has continued that responsibility under these new July 1, 2024 regulations. So institutions will still be responsible for communicating information about where their programs meet and do not meet those educational requirements for licensure in other US states and territories. So let's dig in a little bit further here. Um, first on the understanding piece. So again, institutions need to understand how your programs meet educational requirements uh, in different US states and territories. What's a licensure program anyway, right? <laughs> That's kind of the first consideration here. So we're gonna say, uh, I'm gonna use licensure as I'm talking about this today, but really that's a shorthand term for this broader category of uh, credentials that are required by a state or territory government entity in order to practice in a profession or work in an occupation. So when we say licensure or when you see licensure as listed in these regulations, it really means any type of uh, state or territory government issued credential that's required to work in that profession or occupation. That does not include private issued certifications. So that's a question we often receive. You know, what, what do we need to disclose about uh, IT certification or you know, some other kind of private organization issued certification? Really, you don't need to under these regulations. Uh, there's sometimes a connection between private certification and a state issued license. And we can talk more about that if people have questions. But generally here, we are focused on that state or territory government issued uh, credential to work or practice. So you'll notice here, uh, I say you need to understand in each US state and territory where you're recruiting, advertising, and enrolling students from. So the regulation itself really focuses on the ability to enroll students. Uh, you have to be able, again, under the certify responsibility to say that you meet the educational requirements, or there's an exception, which we'll talk about a little bit with written attestations. But this recruiting and advertising piece uh, is not in the regulation itself. It is coming from Department of Education staff who have been sharing information uh, with myself and I know many other individuals when we've been asking questions about these new regulations. They're making it clear that the department expects uh, institutions to only be recruiting for students and advertising for that licensure program in US states and territories where they understand that they meet those requirements for licensure. So that's key here. Um, moving on then, this does apply to all of your licensure programs, all modes of delivery. One thing that we keep hearing is this um, misunderstanding that these new July 1 regulations only apply to distance education programs. That is not true. They apply equally across the board to all types of programs, all modes of delivery. There are some special considerations related to distance education, uh, including a definition that the department is using um, specifically for the certify responsibility. I'll talk about that in a moment. But this understanding, you need to understand how all of your programs work, whether they're an on-campus face-to-face program or a, a fully online distance education program or some hybrid. So that understanding again, do you meet or do you not meet the educational requirements in other US states and territories where you're recruiting or advertising or enrolling students from? Many of you are probably familiar with this kind of third categorization not determined or no determination made, or maybe you've phrased it as, you know, we've not been able to determine if our program meets requirements. That third categorization is acceptable under the July 1, 2020 regulations. So the Department of Education in 2020's version did not place a responsibility on institutions um, that you had to understand if it meets or not in all 59 uh, U.S. states and territories, um, you did have to disclose through your public disclosure, you had to communicate if you hadn't made that determination. So this not determination understanding still is kind of going to exist under the 2024 version, at least for some programs. So if you're in the process of researching and comparing a program 
and you haven't determined yet whether it meets or does not meet, that would still be an appropriate classification for that state or territory. Uh, and possibly even if, if you have a campus-based face-to-face -face program with no online courses at all, uh, you might kind of have some not determined states and territories uh, for a period of time, maybe even indefinitely in some cases. But if you have not determined for any reason after July 1st of 2024, you need to understand that where you are advertising the program and recruiting the program, and of course, where you're enrolling students from is going to be restricted, right? So you can only be recruiting, advertising, and enrolling in states where you have determined that the program meets those educational requirements. I'm gonna keep going. Um, Nan, if you wouldn't mind, if we get a question in the chat that's relevant, feel free to interrupt me, but otherwise I'm just gonna move on here to the second responsibility around certify. So again, this is the new requirement uh, coming online July 1st of this year. And this responsibility is related to the program participation agreement, the PPA. Um, the PPA is something that uh, those folks who work in financial aid at your institution are very familiar with. Uh, the PPA has been in existence for years. It's essentially the master terms and conditions agreement the contract that institutions have to sign in order to participate in the Title IV uh, student federal financial aid program. So the new piece here, though, is that Department of Education has added another section to the PPA related to licensure. And again, institutions will have to affirmatively certify that your licensure programs meet the educational requirements where your institution is located and where your students are located at the time of initial enrollment into the licensure program. Now, some of you who have maybe heard me uh, do webinars on this topic in the past several months or others who presented on this topic, um, you'll notice distance education. Uh, I did not include that on my slide today because I feel like it just is adding confusion. Again, a lot of people are under the misunderstanding that it, you know, these only apply to distance education students. That's not the case. But we do see in the regulation language itself, uh, which I have available on reference slides here later in the presentation if people want to see it. But in this section of the regulation, it does say where the institution is located and where distance education students are located. Department of Education is using a definition for distance education here that boils down to if a student takes one class or more online or through correspondence uh, at the first term of enrollment in the licensure program, then they're considered a distance education student. So what that means, of course, is practically, we're not talking about distance education programs. We could very well be talking about many, you know, on-campus face-to-face programs where students would be taking some sort of class online during that first term, whether it's a gen ed class or something specific to the licensure program itself. So that's why I'm, I'm phrasing it as where your students are located, because really at the end of the day, um, that's the determination you're going to have to make is where are your students located, whether they're a distant, in a distance education program or your on-campus program or some hybrid, you'll have to be able to just say where are students located and then apply the certify responsibility uh, to where their locations are. So other thing I didn't touch on yet, again, I mentioned it earlier, but you cannot enroll starting July 1 this year or after. You cannot enroll in a licensure program unless you're able to certify that it meets the education requirements where that student is located at the time of initial enrollment. The exception here, though, that the Department of Ed created is around a written attestation. So if you have a student who uh, is able and willing to complete a written statement that says they actually plan to seek licensure and employment in a meets state or territory after they complete your program, you could enroll them even though they're located in a does not meet state or territory. So this written attestation concept, the department talks about it in their commentary that they released with the final regulations in October, 2023. And they're, they were trying to 
create a little bit of room in those scenarios where you have students uh, who have a very specific state in mind that they know they want to be, you know, working in after they complete a program, uh, that they wanted to create this kind of exception process so that it would still allow them to, you know, complete programs in other states. Uh, and again, if they do not meet, you could enroll them as long as the written attestation form is completed and the institution retains that as part of documentation for that particular student and it would need to be retrievable in the event of an audit or should the department ask you for it in the future. Man, got your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, Chris, I didn't want to, I wanted you to be able to pause. <laughs> Thank you. There are quite a few, like half dozen comments about the Department of Education's definition of distance education for for these requirements. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll just read a couple of them. First, shock, that's the first term of class. Uh, and how is that relevant to online versus on campus? And if the rest of the entire program and coursework is on ground, this changes everything. Are you talking about one course or one class? Some accreditors defined it that differently. Uh, so if it's on ground, but hey, they take one English class online because it doesn't work at any other time. Do we have to consider that student a distance education student? That's enough to give you context, I think. Yeah, right. And and you're all correct, right? <laughs> this It is very surprising that this is the definition. So obviously, Department of Education itself has several different ways of defining distance education. Accreditors have their own ways of defining it, you know, other sources, uh, including our state higher education offices. So um, this definition comes from a May 2023 Dear Colleague letter that the U.S. Department of Education put out, which really is addressed to accreditors uh, more so than institutions. But as part of the letter, it provides this, um, this idea that if a student takes one or more classes um, through distance education, then that is a distance education student, right? And so distance education in this particular Dear Colleague letter could be an online class or it could be a correspondence class. Um, but whatever's happening, if a student is taking one of those things, during the first um, during the first term of enrollment, then that is going to be considered distance education. And I should add here because this is important. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but you know, Department of Education staff have been providing information through email uh, to people as they inquire about these regulation changes. So the staff person's name is Vanessa Gomez. Uh, at U.S. Department of Ed, and I've exchanged several emails with her on different questions and topics over the past many months. I know others have as well, maybe even some of you who are on the Zoom today have. Um, so some of this information is trickling out through these individual emails, which means it's not published guidance from the Department of Ed, right? So if you look at the actual release of these regulations back in October of 23, in the regulation itself, distance education is not defined. In the commentary, the preamble that, that came along with that, they don't define distance education. Uh, this definition is coming again from a staff person indicating, well, we will be applying the May 2023 Dear Colleague letter uh, de definition or notion of distance education student to this particular subsection of the new regulation. So wanted to provide that context to let everyone know, you know, there's different layers here of authority. And so we're kind of down into this, getting information from staff, which hasn't been published yet. There is supposed to be additional published guidance on these regulations, including this new PPA certification requirement. Uh, not sure when that's gonna come out, but I would suspect that it would have something about that distance education definition, and maybe even a little further clarity on uh, the department's expectations on how that's being applied to your students. Chris, a follow-up to that, <clears throat> wondering if, how do they, do they need to restrict students taking an online class in the first term? 
That's one. And the other one is how, how are they supposed to know if someone is a distance learner before they register for their first semester? Yeah, I mean, again, great, <laughs> excellent points, right? Um, clearly things that I don't think the Department of Ed was considering when making these decisions on how they expect things to be implemented. So we've heard from institutions that some are choosing to restrict what their um, students can do in the first term of enrollment. So basically putting a blanket restriction, nobody that's enrolling in a you know campus-based face-to-face program can take an online class during that first term. I also know practically that's not going to work well, you know, at some institutions um, that you just simply wouldn't have enough physical class spaces for students to go to. You know, you've set up your your programs and your processes to be utilizing online courses uh, for a portion of those. So it's up to the institution. If it makes sense, if you can do it, you may want to think about that. Um, for the other side of that, it, you know, again, a lot of these things are going to come down to what sort of decision makes sense for your institution and your students that is still within compliance. So there's a lot of gray area in these regulations and in the implementation of them. So I don't want people to get too stuck on, like, how do we limit who's a distance education student? Because I think a more important question is, what is your institution's student location policy? And how are you applying that to different groups of students, whether they're coming onto your campus for a program or you know, if they're taking distance courses and they're also a commuter onto your campus or if it's a fully distance, whatever it is, that student location policy is gonna be the key on, again, what, where, what that particular student um, is going to need to do and what you're gonna to need to provide them in order for them to enroll in your program. So it's all connected to student location this certify responsibility, as well as disclosures, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, but those are really connected to where is the student located. So student location policy is going to be key. Um, and related to that is when you consider them to be initially enrolled in the program. And we can talk about more about that too if people have questions. So the, the distance education definition, it is a little shocking on you know what it actually is. But don't get too caught up in that. I think the bigger questions are, again, what's your student location policy? And what point in time do yours, does your institution consider initial enrollment to happen? Those two things are really going to set the stage for uh, if you need a written attestation from someone, or if you need to send them disclosures, and you know, ultimately that ability to enroll a student based on where they're located. Should I move on to disclosures, Nan, or you think, is there another question or two related here? I think go ahead, Chris. Okay. Thanks. All right. So that third primary responsibility related to this uh, area is around communicating. And I just referenced it. We're talking about disclosures here. Um, many of you have been working with licensure disclosures since July of 2020. That's when these regulations uh, went into effect initially that required public disclosures and individual direct disclosures. Department of Education did not change much uh, when it comes to this communicate responsibility. So institutions will still need to publicly disclose information related to your licensure programs after July 1 of this year. And you'll still have to send out individual direct disclosures to certain students at certain times, depending on where they're located. So there has been a change with the public disclosures which I wanted to, to go into a little bit here. Um, the new regulation, again, starting July 1 of this year, says that institutions must disclose where they've determined that the program meets or does not meet the educational requirements for licensure. So you'll notice that that not determined or no determination made category is no longer included in the public disclosure regulation itself. So practically what that means is the responsibility is you need to disclose where you've determined meets or does not meet. If you have some states or territories that you haven't determined yet, those would not necessarily need to be up on your public disclosures starting July 1. They do need to be up today because again, under 2020, it includes that not determined. 
Um, but if you are removing them after July 1 of this coming year, just keep in mind that connection to recruiting and advertising that I talked about before, right? So uh, if you've got some no determined locations, that may be okay, at least for a short-term period, maybe even a longer-term period, as long as you're staying within those parameters of recruiting and advertising and enrolling. Uh, I wanted to point out this connection to SARA policy, State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement Policy. So um, SARA policy around this is 5.2 is a section number, and it's been around since 2020. It's really connected to the 2020 version of the federal regulations. So it actually references that subsection of the regulations and the SARA policy itself. Um, it, it, SARA policy does a couple of things. So again, it references and points back to the federal 2020 version and says institutions need to be complying with that. Uh, it also says institutions need to be making all reasonable efforts to determine if your programs meet or do not meet the educational requirements in all US states and territories. If you have a not determined location, um, SARA policy says that you should provide the board contact information as part of the public disclosure to the public and prospective students. So um, assuming things move through the SARA policy review uh, process like, like they have in the past, there will be some policies considered uh, that are on the table to change uh, the, you know, the current version 5.2 of SARA policy uh, and kind of bring it more in line with these updated July 1, 2024 regulations uh, and some other changes. So just wanted to point it out though, because it exists today, technically in effect, if you're a SARA participating institution, you should be aware of that and how it might apply. Second big part of communicating is individual direct disclosures. So again, these exist today. Hopefully your institution has a process in place and you've already been doing this for your licensure programs, sending out direct notifications to prospective students uh, or people that are newly admitted prior to initial enrollment if they are located in a does not meet or a not determined state or territory. Moving forward, that same group of uh, newly admitted or prospective students would need to complete a written attestation in order to actually be enrolled in your program. So again, these direct disclosures are going out if it's a does not meet or a not determined location. You can only enroll someone if they're located in a meet state or if they provide you with a written attestation that they plan to seek licensure and employment in a meet state after they complete your program. For current students, you may need to send direct disclosures to them if they relocate while they're enrolled in your program into a does not meet state or territory, or if something changes about a state's requirements and now your program no longer meets it, or maybe something changes with your program's curriculum and you no longer meet a particular state's requirements. So if any of those scenarios happen, you have a student or students in a does not meet location now, you need to send them a direct, no, direct disclosure within 14 calendar days of becoming aware of the change. So somebody updates their address in your system and the address is in a does not meet location. You know, if that's your student location policy is connected to that address as kind of the trigger uh, for location, then you would have 14 calendar days to get that direct disclosure out to them in the does not meet state. I think that's all I'll say about that. So um, any other questions, Nan, that came in that you think we should address now before we shift gears into a little bit of discussion? There are a couple of questions and then, yes, it'd be great to hear from others. Uh, not that I don't love hearing from you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from uh, for the licensure to be financial aid eligible, doesn't the student have to already receive a bachelor's degree? Hmm. I'm not quite sure what that question is getting at. I mean, there are, of course, certain professions that require a graduate degree or something beyond a bachelor's degree in order to qualify for a license. Um, there are licenses that are available at a bachelor's level and some even at an associate's level um, or less. So it kind of runs the gamut and, of course, depends on the particular profession or occupation. And then even within that, states can set their own standards. So um, 
you know, some nursing as an example, uh, I believe there are at least a few states now that are requiring a bachelor's degree in nursing in order to qualify for the, the RN license and others will still accept an associate's degree, you know, or a diploma, uh, even in some instances. So it can kind of be run the gamut across states. Okay, thanks. And then can you share what happens if a college does not meet the requirements you've been reviewing by July 1? Mm. Right. So July 1 is the effective date of these regulations. It is the implementation date. Um, it is, at least as far as we know now, and I think moving forward, the department's expectation that all institutions would be in compliance by that date. So what I mean by that is they haven't, you know, uh, provided any information that a delay in some portion of this would be acceptable. So we have to kind of operate under the assumption that July 1 is the date where everyone should be in compliance with this. What can happen if you're not in compliance? Well, this is part of Title IV regulation. So really any kind of um, action by the department or any kind of penalties, you know, it's all the same things that, that you could receive for any sort of violation of Title IV regulations. Um, so I am not an expert on exactly what all that looks like, but my understanding is, you know, typically it's gonna start with um, a notification of some sort from the department that you're out of compliance. Um, you would typically have the opportunity to remedy that within a certain time frame. If that doesn't happen, then it escalates from there. Ultimately, an institution could lose the ability for the whole institution to participate in Title IV, um, again, that would be kind of at the upper levels of penalty, obviously, but that's ultimately all flowing through Title IV. So whatever could happen as far as, uh, you know, penalty or repercussion is possible. All right, I'm going to shift gears now into discussion. So this is where we're going to um, encourage all of you to <laughs> step maybe outside of your comfort zone a little bit. We know that for many of you, this could be um, kind of your first introduction to what some of the, these requirements are. You maybe haven't heard a lot of detail about them, or maybe you did know some detail, but you haven't really spent um, much time yet thinking through you know, how is this going to be implemented at my institution? Or, you know, what are we going to do as far as student location policy, that type of thing. So we're hoping to have a discussion so that uh, we can all learn from each other and kind of think through the implementation of these together. So on that note, I have a few questions, several questions that I was hoping we could talk about as a group. Um, I'm really curious if any of you have, um, maybe already, even under the July 1, 2020 regulations, set a specific point in time as initial enrollment uh, at your institution. So we know some institutions have created uh, student location policies that also define initial enrollment when they consider that point in time to happen, uh, or maybe it's done through a separate kind of policy or you know documented um, process for the institution. But have any of you set what point in time is initial enrollment? And there's no wrong answer, by the way, here. So, <laughs> well, that's not true. If you told me it was uh, senior year, that would be a wrong answer. But <laughs> there are, um, there my, are my multiple name is points. Brian. My name is Brian from Jackson College. And to my knowledge, no program has set an initial enrollment other than when they, like I'm thinking of our second admit programs, when they apply to that program. So they're not thinking about initial enrollment being when the student comes to us initially, uh, especially in our second admit programs where they have gen eds and other kinds of courses they have to take. I'm wondering if that's acceptable. Yeah, so that bring up a good point, Brian. Uh, often here we have these scenarios where you're gonna have students admitted to your institution, into something, maybe their undeclared major or some pre-licensure kind of you know, category. And then later on, once they complete some things, they can apply for and be admitted to a licensure program at that point. Um, this is specific to the licensure program. So the point of initial enrollment in the licensure program itself. 
which may be distinct from when they first enroll at your institution. So um, I think to answer your question, Brian, yes, it sounds like those programs, your programs are thinking about that in the right way. I will just put out uh, an idea or a thought to consider though. Um, if these are programs where students are going to be located in other states or territories, at, basically if it's a distance education program or if you have commuter students going across state lines, you may wanna consider disclosing to them while they're in that initial enrollment process for the institution. So into the pre-licensure program or the undeclared major. Because it's not going to be good for anybody if you get into the scenario where, you know, you have people that are in does not meet locations, they're applying for the licensure program, and you say, oh, wait a minute, we can't enroll you in this program because you're located here, we don't meet the requirements. Um, do you actually want to be licensed here in Michigan? And they might say no at that point, and, you know, then it, the whole thing's kind of falling apart for them, not a good experience. So, uh, it may be worth having that information available to the pre-licensure students on the front end, again, especially if it's truly a distance education program or you've got commuter students, uh, if there are some does not meet scenarios for states around you. All right, that's, that's complicated, helpful, but complicated. Uh, there, there are some programs that don't have that initial pre-licensure status. It's just a undeclared student who's working through gen eds in order to get it. I guess our advisors would be the first to know. So we might have to come up with a way to have them query students about their interests and then make sure that we're uh, connecting them with the program for that direct disclosure very early on. Yeah, definitely challenges for sure. Well, yeah. One wouldn't that include, in addition to distance setting commuter students over state lines, wouldn't it include any student who's going to be a, who's going to be a student of the program? And if even if it's in face to face, if they're coming to your university from a different state and they're not commuting, they're going to live in your state. You that counts, right? Because the the assumption is they're probably going to go back home and try to get a job in their home state. Well, I, I think, Steve, it's actually going to boil down to what is the institution student location policy say about where that student right. is located as far as the uh, responsibilities under this federal regulation. I do know okay. we've heard. So yeah, we, we've, we can we've define heard, out, out of state residential students. We could define them as Michigan residents because they're they're full time on campus. If that's our policy, is that is that what you're saying? Yes, institutions have flexibility to create your own student location policy and processes okay. for these purposes, which may be distinct from like a tuition residency determination. Um, we've seen examples of student location policies where institutions are very explicit about that. Uh, this is our policy for licensure disclosure purposes or you know licensure PPA certification purposes. This is not superseding our tuition residency policy. So you can definitely set it up where um, these, these are a little bifurcated and you could have a different outcome uh, for your students who are going to be coming onto your campus in Michigan, you know, to complete that face-to-face -face program, but their permanent address um, might be somewhere else where they are coming from their families or, or homes from high school. Okay. Thank you. Chris, um, can you define a student location policy? Can I define it? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, so this is one of those gray areas where Department of Ed has not provided um, you know, clear parameters or a framework for what this student location policy needs to be. However, uh, they do indicate that every institution needs to have a formal student location policy in place for these purposes. Uh, it needs to be applied consistently um, and it needs to be made available to the Department of Education should they ever ask you for it. So it is important to have a formal policy in place. I will say there's also a, a little bit of a connection here to uh, state authorization. Those federal regulations, which um, I know many of you have been tracking closely, they just finished the negotiated 
rulemaking session uh, for those last week and did not come to any consensus. So it's all a bit up in the air on what's going to happen with state authorization in the federal regulations moving forward. But um, there is a uh, basically a reference back to uh, student location within those state authorization federal regulations that the department's made here for these purposes. So all that being said, again, we don't have a clear definition or guidance on, on exactly what it needs to be, just that each institution should have a formal policy that's defining student location for these purposes. Just to give you some samples, maybe I'll put Nan on the spot again. Um, we have some examples that we put together that come from institutions that we've um, worked with or that we have just found their policies. Uh, so we've got a few samples and they really run the gamut. So we've got people who are tying location to the permanent address of the student uh, at the time of initial enrollment. We have other institutions who are saying, no, it's about where that student's going to physically be on the first day of class. So I, one policy that I always get uh, a kick out of is they actually included language. It's where the student lays their head down at night. That is their location for these purposes. Um, and then we, of course, have other kind of parameters or uh, address, you know, address keys that are being connected here to the student location policy. So many ways to approach it. And it's going to look a little different for each institution, depending on, um, you know, your types of programs you're offering, your student population, your geographic proximity to a border, state border, um, lots of things to consider here. Does anybody have a student location policy that you'd like to talk about? Um, maybe it's one you created for the 2020 version of the regulations. Uh, you're just starting to think about if you need to update that. Or maybe you've gotten further down the road and you've already made some changes or updates for July 1 of this year. Well, Chris, while people are thinking about that, and I hope we do hear some, is there a statewide database that lists standard licenses and their reciprocity with the state or territory? Uh, I'm not aware of a database that would list that. You can get it information related to um, reciprocity and different license types using several different sources, right? So um, I'm not aware of uh, a single database that is put out by a state or other entity. Um, we're not meaning for this to be a sales pitch for us, but <laughs> Higher Education Licensure Pros does offer an online database called the Bookmark, where we've researched the educational requirements for over 70 different license types and we have compiled those into one source of information. So institutions who become members of the bookmark can use that as a research library, basically. Um, so you can get information from that source instead of going out to multiple sources uh, to try to determine what educational requirements are or if they will accept another state's program or license through a reciprocity kind of pathway. We're pretty caught up on messages, on chat, questions. All right, so I'll throw another, throw another discussion question. Please don't be shy. I know it can be overwhelming to uh, speak up in a large group, which we are a larger group today. But um, does anyone wanna talk about your process for, for doing that research at your institution? So who's actually looking at what other states require as far as educational requirements for licensure, um, who are doing the program comparison. So some license types, you have to you know, look very closely at the courses and curriculum, uh, maybe practicum or internship hours and match those up with other states' requirements. Anyone wanna share how you're tackling that? 
we're having our program leads who are the most knowledgeable people about the discipline that they're preparing people for licensure sure do. But my concern is, are there programs that we don't think of as licensure programs that there's one state that might have some certification that we don't know about and no one has been thinking about that would change that? Yeah, you bring up a great point, Brian. So um, someone just asked this question earlier today. We did a similar session for another state and this question came up. Um, I think a couple of things to keep in mind when you're trying to narrow down your list of licensure programs at your institution, it's really about what has the program been designed to do and what is it advertised to do? So if you've designed a program that could lead to a profession or occupation that requires a license in other states and territories, it probably belongs on your list of licensure programs, even if they don't require or offer that license in Michigan, in this case itself. But how do you even know what all those professions are, to your point, Brian? Like, there's so many different licensed professions and occupations out there. Um, so there are a few different places that have, you know, listings of different occupations and professions that require some sort of state-issued license or certification. Uh, I'm going to see if Nan could find those links at some point in the next couple of minutes, too, and put them in the chat. Um, but unfortunately, again, there's not one master source that we know about where you could go and, you know, just see, okay, what, what is there out, out there for this um, particular profession or occupation or related programs? So it's kind of piecing together from different sources and making your best efforts as an institution located in Michigan, you know, to understand what's out there. Uh, in particular, if, if this is a scenario where the program is being offered through distance education, so you should know if there's a license required where you're enrolling students for that program. I think that would be an expectation of Department of Ed. So it wouldn't be enough to say, well, there's no Michigan license and you know we weren't we don't know if there's other states that issue the license. You're probably going to have to do some more legwork if it's a distance ed program and you're enrolling students from other states. Yeah, so right now, we kind of have to consider all of our programs as distance education because I think the rule is 50% of your coursework or more, it automatically becomes a distance education according to our uh, accreditation body. And with almost all of our classes, having an online option at some point or another, it, there may be students who are intentionally choosing a path that makes a course of study completely online that we didn't really intend to be completely online. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's definitely a challenge. It, you know, it's definitely a challenge. So if you've got programs that you think could be related to a license, but there's nothing required in Michigan, um, I would say, look at where your students are enrolled from, where your students' locations are for your current students, right. and make sure you've, you've done your research at least there for those states. Yeah, the other thing that confounds this is our college calls things programs, which really aren't programs like the wording of the Title IV and others, I think, intends. A program is just a group of classes, like we have a, a um, foundation studies program. That just means it's a that's an organization, a, a group of faculty who are considered to be a program, like a department. So mm. we have to sort that out also. Yeah, ter a terminology, right? So it obviously differs from state to state, but even from institution to institution. So um, for these purposes, it would be a Title IV program. So a program as defined uh, for Title IV federal financial aid purposes um, to keep that in mind. So yeah, it's, you got a lot. <laughs> we got a lot to sort through. Everybody does. Right. Chris, uh, Stasia, am I saying that right? Is happy to share um, Michigan State University's work with professional licensing. Yeah, Stacia um, Morowski Rigney here. Yeah, and I have a great team member, Sandy Townsend, who's also in the call. Um, but 
she's been updating our list and moving things out of no determination made. Uh, but I dropped the link in the chat to our most recent update of professional licensure and certification disclosures. Um, so that might help people know at least what we're looking at um, at MSU. And I can also drop our website in the chat, which has some other resources there. Thanks so much, Stacia. Anybody else want to share about your process? Or if you have questions for how to get started in the research and comparison processes? Something I don't think came up yet uh, from this group, but um, sometimes we get the question, you know, how often do we have to be updating this information, right? So um, it's one thing to go through and, and do the research and compare your programs for like one point in time, right? So get that all done by June <laughs> this year, but then how often do you have to be uh, reviewing that research uh, and maybe comparing programs again and updating information, in particular those public disclosures that'll be up on your website. There's no dictated time frame in these regulations, so the department hasn't put you know a firm uh, deadline, if you will, on this for when institutions need to make these reviews and, and updates if needed. Um, we do see though that a lot of other Title IV related reporting requirements are on an annual cadence, right? So there's a reporting deadline, you have to submit certain things at least uh, once a year to the institution. So that's what we've been advising institutions that we work with is build out your own internal process for a once a year a review of information and then update of your public disclosures and direct disclosure information that's going out to students. So at least that annual basis even better if you can track changes happening throughout that year. So there's different software tools uh, that some institutions subscribe to that help them track you know, proposed legislation or pending regulation changes um, in an effort to try to catch things as they're coming up throughout the year. Chris, I have a question for you. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, so the third bullet point, it says, do you have a template for the required written attestation for perspective, from prospective students located in a does not meet state or territory that still want to enroll? Uh, is that also, uh, you have not determined also, or? Um, it, it would apply to not determined also. You're right, Jeff. Yep. So if you've got, uh, prospective students in a not determined, you would need a written attestation for them in order to enroll. Okay, thank you. Anyone have a written attestation? Um, language, template, form, whatever you want to call it. Anyone have something that they've been working on, even if it's not finalized yet? Anything you want to share about that? This one's a challenge also because we don't have uh, any sort of provided template or form from the department on this or even exact language on, on what needs to be included here. This is Stacia again. I just wanted, I dropped in the chat, um, Virginia Commonwealth is the first sample that I had seen. So I dropped it in the chat. Awesome. Thanks, Stacia. We had a couple of examples uh, also that we had found uh, the student location policy example document that I think Nan had put the link into. It also has a couple of written attestation examples on there. And our institution requests as part of their admissions documentation, there's a line in one of our documents that says, ask the student to attest to their physical location at the time of, en of enrollment. Um, and then uh, our policy is that if they change their location, they're required to notify us of that 
um, and they attest to that. That's kind of our policy. And then, as I mentioned, there's a, a, a line in our um, admissions documentation where the student declares their um, state of their actual physical location. So they actually have to put it in there. Uh, so we have that as part of the enrollment information. Question for you, Jeff. Do you know yet what's going to happen if a student puts that their physical or actual location, however it's phrased, is in a does not meet state? Is that going to trigger something in your system where it's going to block enrollment from them? What do you have a plan for uh, that? That's uh, something we have to discuss still. Um, we don't have a good. Uh, uh, I don't have a good handle on yet exactly how it's going to work. Yeah, fair enough. Again, I know there's a lot to sort through with all this. And once you kind of figure out the you know policies and, and some of the processes, then it's actually fitting those into your uh, SIS and other IT systems that are doing this stuff behind the scenes as part of enrollment and admission. Sarah, go ahead. I see a hand up. Thanks. Could you um, tell us a little bit about the uh, wonderful document you created, uh, the licensure board and agency directory um, that you'll be updating for MEC? Yes. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we put out, uh, it would have been July of 2023, um, the second version of a uh, very lengthy, comprehensive spreadsheet where we've listed licensing board and agency um, names, the professions that they regulate, at least at a high level. And it has their URL links directly to their website, uh, contact phone number, and email addresses. And so that document is available on MEC's website. If you look at the past convenings, and if you find um, basically any of the professional licensure related, related past convenings over the past couple of years um, we've been a part of for MEC. And so in particular, if you find the one uh, from last year, I believe it was early August, sometime around there, um, you can find a link directly to that licensing board and agency directory. And as Sarah mentioned, we're working on an update, which will be available uh, this summer. And we're uh, hoping to improve the functionality and usability of it so that you would be able to search by profession or occupation. Uh, so kind of, um, apologies, I forget who was just talking to me about that a few moments ago, um, but it, you would be able to use that as another you know, source of information to quickly and easily try to discern if there are licenses being issued in other states for uh, a program you know, related to what you're offering. So more to come on that, and uh, I'm sure that MEC will, will help advertise when that's ready to go and, and get that out so that you can all use it if it will be useful. Great. Do we have any other questions in the chat, man, that we hadn't covered yet? No. Uh, Sarah did drop the link for the board agency licensure director you just talked about. <clears throat> and Stasha dropped quite a few links that are very informative, um, but no questions. So part of why uh, Mex put set up these sessions by state is so that you could talk to each other, find out what um, you're doing in your state. But also I know Chris is happy to answer any other questions as well. If anyone wants to uh, just vent that you are totally overwhelmed by all this, this is a safe place <laughs> to do that as well. I think everyone here knows uh, the frustrations that are coming along with this particular work on top of a lot of other changes happening, you know, for July and into October now um, with some of the gainful employment stuff. So, Speaking of that, Chris, Tim asks, are there any 
Are there many changes in the Department of Education and its operations if the federal government changes with this impact this issue? Mm -hmm. oh, depending on like the election, you mean if we have a new administration? It may be that, Tim, maybe you want to say it might be the, the negregs too. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think, you know, knowing that it is a presidential election year uh, and presidents get to appoint leadership for these agencies, including Department of Education, there can be sometimes a change in what happens down at the regulatory level. Uh, it's usually not a swift, immediate change. I think that that maybe has happened at, at some points in the past, but um, usually it, it could be more of a gradual type of change if that were to happen. I will point out that um, the July 1, 2020 regulations, you know, happened under um, Trump's administration. And so if, if you're kind of calculating, you know, is one administration going to do less or more on this? Um, for this particular issue, it's been kind of interesting because it's it really has been uh, bipartisan regulations <laughs> that have been uh, implemented or, or uh past and become effective for different administrations here. Yes, Tim did clarify he, that was what he was looking at, <clears throat> the pre presidential and congressional elections. And there are other comments and chat uh, questions about that. But first, Sherry, did you want to offer something? Looks like you tried to jump in. Oh, um, thank you, Nan. I appreciate that. I was just kind of saying, you mentioned the opportunity to voice some frustration. So I'm going to voice some frustration. We can't, we can't even get the FAFSA right. And so I can't even imagine why we're trying to do all of this right now when that isn't even where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. So I'm just voicing the frustration that we have too much of this going on when we need to be focusing on student mental health. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, that's all I wanted to add. You, you don't need to be sorry, Sherry. Absolutely, absolutely, um, you know, I totally understandable to be frustrated. And the FAFSA piece in particular, I mean, that's, I don't even know what to say about it other than it's just uh, seems completely unacceptable that here we are in April and we've still got people waiting to get their FAFSA information and for institutions to be able to be letting, you know, students know what's going to be available to them <laughs> for this upcoming uh, fall term. So it's, it's not good for anybody all around. It's just hard to be worried about this when I'm still worried about that. Mm -hmm. so I appreciate yeah. you acknowledging it. And right, the reality is we're all humans and we only have so much time and energy to put in to work each day. So, you know, you're right. Your, your focus may not be on this still for another month or six weeks or whatever it is um, if you're trying to work through those other issues that are, are more pressing for your students and your institutions right now. Uh, it looks like, is it Zena or Zena? Your hand up. Zena, yes. Zena. Um, so the regulations around this particular initiative and the Title IV eligibility, I'm assuming has not been formalized yet because I haven't seen anything. And everything that I've seen says something related to a post back program and that eligibility cannot be determined unless the students meet those requirements. But from this um, discussion, it appears that that may not be the case any longer. And the reason I'm asking is because I'm at a community college. And I understand mm -hmm. that some certifications are not, you know, you can have an associate degree. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But now that it's out there, this is going to be pushed heavily. So I need to be clear you know, around the guidance and the intent or some kind of forecasting of when that may come out or mm -hmm. is there anything that defines exactly how aid can be 
award it? Yeah, so I will say, Zena, that you know this does apply to any Title IV eligible program that an institution is offering at any level. So if you have things that result in or help prepare people for an occupational license, it could be called a certification or something else, again, issued by a state or territory government entity. Um, if you have those things, it would need to comply with these three new responsibilities. Um, you have to understand if it meets educational requirements where your students are located, you have to be able to certify that it does meet educational requirements where you're enrolling students or you get that written attestation and then the public and direct disclosure responsibilities. Um, as far as additional guidance, we are expecting the Department of Education to release some sort of written question and answer or FAQ kind of document at some point. Um, I just don't know when. I, I, I've asked if they have a projected release date and I haven't received an answer. I'm hopeful that it's in the next you know, couple few weeks because if it's any longer than that, then we're gonna be at the end of this academic calendar year for most people, um, which is an important date to keep in mind since we have a July 1 you know, summer implementation date here. So did I did I mistakenly hear or misunderstand? Um, this has to be added to the PPA. Is that correct? There's a, a provision that will be in the PPA starting July one that is like an affirmative statement that an institution will have to be able to you know affirm yes we meet yes. the educational requirements. Okay. Well, I mean, that's a problem because updating the PPA could take eight weeks. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, it's a long process and I just don't want, um, you know, my institution to feel like this is something that they can start and then expect students to get Title IV aid. That's all. So I'm just mm -hmm. trying to be clear. I'm not trying to cause any problems. Thank you. No, no problems at all. Um, I will say, just to clarify what you just said, Zena, so... I don't think that as far as what will need to be inputted into the PPA, um, I don't think that there's going to be like lengthy information where institutions will have to actually, you know, put in information specific to the programs and how they're meeting other states requirements. Like you're not going to have to include here are the 50 states that we're enrolling students in you know, here are all of those educational requirements, and then here is how our program meets those. I think it's really going to be more of a shorthand affirmation statement where the institutions saying, yes, our program meets education requirements everywhere that we are enrolling students. So wherever those students are located, if that okay. makes sense. Thank you. Chris, uh, John asks, is there any chance that the, that the department tables this regulation for another year? Man, I wish John, right? <laughs> I think everybody on the Zoom wishes. Um, I, I continue to ask different people that have different connections to the department and everyone's consensus is no. Um, th this is it's very, very unlikely that they would extend this effective date or you know put in some sort of um, provision to push this out so i think we all need to operate under the assumption that this is moving forward as it is july 1 this year effective date for all sections i know they they just uh extended the gainful employment reporting implementation uh, for part of that into october which was nowhere near the amount of time, you know, that people were advocating for an extension for that one. Um, but for this one, it, it's very, very unlikely that there would be any sort of extension offered. And I think this is worth um, doing a quick review on. Um, Mike asked, so what are the main differences between the current requirements in effect now and the ones going into effect in July? other than the PPA certification? Mm -hmm. So the other change really is related to public disclosures. So 
under today's requirements, the 2020 requirements, there's three categories that institutions need to list on public disclosures, states and territories where your program meets the education requirements, those where it does not meet, and those where you have not determined or you haven't been able to make a determination. So the change for July 1, 2024 is the department's removed that third category, the not determined or no determination made. So practically, again, what that means is institutions have to disclose on your websites or somewhere in a published catalog, somewhere that's available to the public, um, that you've made these determinations on states and territories where your program meets education requirements and those where it does not meet. You may still want to include some not determined states. Uh, it's not required anymore. There could be instances where an institution would want to include a listing of those locations that you haven't determined yet on public disclosures, but it's no longer required after July 1. Other than that, it's the same. So direct disclosures haven't changed at all. Uh, maybe a silly question. So my uh, lead faculty in some of these programs are saying, okay, you tell me yes, no, not yet determined. But what if we can't find information from a state? What do we put down? Do we put down no or not yet determined? Yeah, I think, Brian, we've heard institutions handling this either way, right? So some of them are gonna leave it as undetermined and what that practically means, again, is you could not enroll someone who's located there unless they complete a written attestation that says, I'm actually going to seek licensure and employment in this particular meet state after I complete the program. Um, or some are choosing to put it in the does not meet category if they're so not able to find information or figure it out. Even if there is no information that tells you that the state where the student lives even considers this something that they need to license. You, mm. you have to say, sorry, we can't enroll you in this. I see what you're saying. So this isn't, uh, we know a license exists, but we can't find the information. It exists this in some a, state, but not state X. Right, right. So this one, again, institutions are handling in different ways. I've heard some are going to list as does not meet, even though, that may not be true because it might not exist anyway. Um, some are going to use uh, basically like an, an additional separate category where they're going to list in the public disclosures, you know, this state or territory does not offer or does not require this type of license. So yeah, I have one that has put that into the space where I've told them, you can only put yes, no, or not yet determined. They're putting this state does not offer a license in this area. But in not all cases do I see a website which tells me that that's where they got that information. So it's just a little complication. Yeah. You know, and that is hard when you're doing the research. I know that Nan and I run into this too, right? So you're scouring things, of course, relying on general searches as much as you can. And then we're looking through state law all of those things. And if you're not finding anything, there's just nothing that exists for that profession. I mean, the conclusion is that that state isn't regulating that profession, but how do you document the absence of something? Right. That's that very, <laughs> right, exactly. Very challenging to do. So um, I mentioned this, I think earlier, but that's why it is important that you are retaining documentation related to the research and the program comparisons and even if it's just a note from that, you know, program director or faculty member that says, I looked at everything available, including, you know, this national association website, and there doesn't seem to be a license that exists in that state. Um, just try to cover your bases and, and document how that conclusion has been made. Thanks. Sonia, go ahead. Okay, so to piggyback off of that, we at Lawrence Tech have a cardiovascular perfusion program, and I was just in contact with Sarah on this, um, because only a handful of states require an actual license for the cardiovascular perfusionists, and I was like, so those states that don't require a license, 
but our curriculum is specific for that. And usually they're like nurses, uh, they're nurses or some other medical professional that has some other type of license. How do I state that? And what she responded to me was that if, um, that she pulled it from the regulation that said, if a state does not have a requirement for a particular program, you could always provide notice to the student that there are no requirements for that program. So for those states that don't have it, like Alaska doesn't have one that says, yes, you have to have a license to be a cardiovascular perfusionist. That's what I'm going to put on there under my little graph that I put up on our website. These states do not have a requirement for the perfusionist versus like California does. And yes, we meet their curriculum mm -hmm. requirements. So mm -hmm. that's kind of where he's going with that. And I know there's some like interior design also has certain requirements like that. And that's coming from a, there's an actual perfusionist organization that monitors all of that. Because mm -hmm. I've been through nursing so far and PA program and scoured rules, regulations, laws, statutes, till I'm blind and seeing triplicates because it's like they bury it so far in there. And some of them don't even have education requirements listed. They just say must graduate from an accredited school it's like well but that doesn't tell me if my curriculum matches your curriculum requirements mm -hmm. which is very frustrating when you're going through 59 different locations mm -hmm. so yep absolutely i mean hit the nail on the head sonia so so much to dig through and wade through with this and um glad that you found a good solution for what to do with those states where there's not a license offered. It, it makes a lot of sense to me to have those as a separate category rather than putting it in does not meet. But some institutions may choose to have it in does not meet. And I think that would be acceptable under the federal regulations too. Yeah, Chris. This Hi, is Jim. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback just what Sony was saying. It's all about transparency. This is the whole thing that we're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Like she said, that makes sense of what she's putting in there because it's all about transparency. Because that tells me that she did some research mm -hmm. rather than just, okay, that's that's what I'm trying to get at. That, that would make more sense. Just that was my input. That's all. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if we kind of zoom back out and think about, you know, why do these regulations even exist? Well, the Department of Ed would say we're trying to provide transparency to students, you know, transparency, uh, even to taxpayers, right? At the end of the day, we want to make sure that students are getting into programs that are going to help them meet their career objectives, which in this case means licensure or certification and employment in that profession. So um, it's good to, to keep those bigger objectives in mind as you're thinking about your own decisions related to this. Chris, no, no questions in the, in the chat. Okay. I was going to say we have a few minutes left. If anyone else has uh, thoughts, questions, other frustrations you would like to get off your, your mind or your chest this afternoon. I did mention before, uh, again, this is not meant to be a sales call, but uh, just to let you know, we have um, services and support. We offer institutions related to this work, including the bookmark which is our online database we've created using a thorough uh, research process to compile information for over 70 license types. Uh, we also work individually with institutions on some of these other pieces, like uh, setting up a process for comparing curriculum for your programs versus the state's requirements. We can do custom webinars or education for people at institutions as well as different types of research projects. And we always like to talk about this stuff. So please, if you have questions after today uh, or encounter something, you know, that you think is um, maybe something that we haven't heard of yet or something that's that's going on that you're hearing out there, let us know. You can reach us um, via email or phone or through find us on LinkedIn. So always happy to, to talk about licensure compliance and related issues. 
speaking of that, Chris uh, is um, presenting another webinar uh, hosted by Mech soon, and I'll find a link for that. Sarah did post it earlier. And another question came up, Chris. Uh, thoughts on whether this movement is part of a general trend to move to a nationalized accreditation system away from mm. regional accreditors? Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting to think about, isn't it, on how some of these regulatory shifts by Department of Ed maybe have a uh, larger objective in mind. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I have an a, opinion or thought on that in particular. I will say, I think one of the maybe unintended side effects of this July 1, 2020 regulation and now this expanded responsibilities here for July of this year. Um, it really is sort of ultimately maybe going to create less differences with educational requirements for licensure between states. And I think we're seeing that in some of these professions that were maybe outliers where they had some unique, you know, coursework required or something um, that are adopting a specialized accreditation as a standard. So I'm thinking of like in the counseling world, right? There have been a number of states in the past few years uh, moving towards KCREP as a specialized accreditor for a degree. So I think an unintended consequence, I don't know that anyone at Department of Ed thought that that was gonna happen or that that was their ultimate goal um, in relation to specialized accreditors, but on the uh, regional versus you know one national accreditor, I'm not sure how that will shake out or if these will have an influence on that in the future at all. Hi, Chris, I just had a, another quick follow-up question. Um, so uh, the, these new rigs, so I know they were really um, uh, trying to get at, as you mentioned just a few minutes ago, they want students to um, enroll in programs where they can get licensed if that's required uh, so that they can, you know, pay their loans back and whatnot. Um, but we are, but institutions are still allowed to enroll from your perspective. Students, if uh, if it's a do not meet or a, you have a determined state, if there's an attestation. Correct. So that attestation, again, specifically would have to be a statement by the student that says, you know, I intend to seek licensure and employment in this meets state. It could be Michigan or it could be any other state or territory where you've determined that the program meets educational requirements. So the department hasn't given us the exact language, but from what they've shared, again, through staff emails, basically, um, that's the gist of it, is it has to be a statement by the student that's indicating and identifying and indicating one specific meet state where they plan to seek licensure and employment after they complete the program. So if they're in a, if they currently reside in a does not meet state or you have a determined state, then they still have to state that they intend to seek employment in a meets state? Yes, that's the written attestation that the department will be looking for in okay. order for, for you to enroll them. Thank you. Welcome. Nothing in the chat. All right. I mean, there's a well, lot in there, but nothing yeah. <laughs> that you have. Nothing addressed. to cover. I was going to say, uh, I think we'll probably wrap up for today. I'm not sure, um, Sarah, if you had any anything you wanted to close us out with here at the end. I just wanted to say thanks, everyone, again, for making time this afternoon. Thank you for all your great questions uh, and participating and sharing information and resources with each other. And don't hesitate to reach out to us if, if we can be of any sort of help to you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nan. Just a reminder that um, the uh, recording of this presentation will be available as well as a document with links to various resources. Uh, so you can keep up with the, the webinars um, upcoming and past as well as some things we've got on the website and um, also some wonderful resources that folks have shared with us in the chat. So. Thank you all so very much. Enjoy your, your day. I hope it's as beautiful in Michigan as it is here in Southeast Missouri. Take care. Bye-bye.